Hi, my name is Junius Johnson, and I've been uh, a fan of C.S. Lewis and all of his writings for a long time. I remember I first read the Cosmic Trilogy when I was in high school, and I got to the end of that hideous strength, and I can remember this feeling that I had of just being overwhelmed that somebody could conceive of and execute a book like this. And I think the first thought that I had was, oh, I really wish I could write like that. Um, so I've been a fan of these books for a long time as well, but it has been, um, in all the teaching I've done, I've never had an opportunity to actually teach these books. And so I'm really excited about this upcoming course that I'm teaching through Junius Johnson Academics on the Cosmic Trilogy, where we'll spend 10 weeks uh, on the trilogy, three weeks on the, um, Out of the Silent Planet, three weeks on Parallel Engine, and four weeks on That Hideous Strength. So what I wanted to do in this video is to introduce the trilogy and some of the background to both the type of books they are, the, the genre that Lewis is writing into, Lewis's own history with that genre, some of his sources and influences, and some of what he is attempting to do with the trilogy so that we're ready on day one to just dive right into the books and, and get into it. So um, that's what I'm going to do over the next 30 minutes or so is just kind of introduce some of that stuff and lay out some of those details. So let's get started. Um, so this the first question is, what is... The Cosmic Trilogy. And the simple answer is The Cosmic Trilogy is a series of science fiction novels written by C.S. Lewis consisting of Out of the Silent Planet, which was published in 1938, Paralandra, published in 1943, and That Hideous Strength, subtitled A Modern Fairy Tale for Grown Ups, published in 1945. Um, so that's kind of what these are. So then the next question becomes what types of books are these? They're, they're science fiction books. But this might not be the type of science fiction that you're used to. Um, this is what, what I would call old school sci-fi, the science fiction of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The big names in this brand of science fiction were Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. Um, and concerning this field, uh, Hugo Gernsback, who was the publisher of the really, this really important American science fiction magazine, Amazing Stories, where a lot of the great science fiction writers got their start and published, he wrote this um, about uh, this, this discipline, which he calls science fiction. By science fiction, I mean the Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, and Edgar Allan Poe type of story. A charming romance intermingled with scientific fact and prophetic vision. Not only do these amazing tales make tremendously interesting reading, they are always instructive. They supply knowledge in a very palatable form. New adventures pictured for us in the science fiction of today are not at all impossible of realization tomorrow. Many great science stories destined to be of historical interest are still to be written. Posterity will point to them as having blazed a new trail, not only in literature and fiction, but progress as well. Now, that's a really important description, and we're going to come back to that later because I think that's going to interact in very interesting ways with what Lewis is trying to do in his own science fiction trilogy. But it's very important when you think about this, then, you know, the fact that it's old school science fiction, that it's that more um, late 19th, early 20th century science fiction means that you shouldn't think about it as what we typically mean by science fiction today, which is epitomizing something like Star Wars. Science really has little or nothing to do with most Star Wars plots. They are instead space fantasies. It is true that you have technological terrors like the Death Star, but no one cares about the actual science of the Death Star. What matters is that like the Force, which is indistinguishable from magic, it is a super weapon. And I don't say this to criticize Star Wars, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, but it's just a description of what's going on in it, and it's a very different take on what to do with a science fiction story than um, what H.G. Wells or Jules Verne were doing. So instead, the sort of science fiction we're talking about grounds itself on a particular piece of science or a technological or cultural speculation and develops as a sort of what if from there. This gives it a more grounded character than the science fantasy type story where a futuristic or intergalactic society is more or less a backdrop for action that could have happened anywhere at any time. For example, a galaxy far, far away a long time ago. So as such then, this series, given that that's the case, this series that Lewis wrote is going to present a challenge to the modern reader who's not used to reading late 19th century science fiction or indeed Victorian novels of any type. Um, and the challenge is that they show their age. The sense of pacing, 
characterization, the way that place is established, and the mood are all following a very different sensibility than one has felt since perhaps Asimov's foundation novels. This means that these books require patience from the modern reader, and in some places, to be quite honest, tenacity. Many, many a reader has struggled through the early stages of that hideous strength for just this reason. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about the background uh, of, this, of these books and some of the sources. So um, Lewis, in his childhood, was a huge fan of science fiction. His interest, um, he was a big fan of H.G. Wells and Jules Verne as a child, and he was keenly interested in astronomy. So he himself writes, the idea of other planets exercised upon me a peculiar, heady attraction, which was quite different from any other of my literary interests. The interest, when the fit was on me, was ravenous, like a lust. Now this is telling. If Lewis's fascination with the planets is of a more absorbing and consuming sort than his other literary interests, that says something about the role these books play in the constellation of his writings. They are not an aberration or the result of a peripheral concern. Oh, that would be fun to write science fiction. I'll try that out. Rather, they're central to the corpus, expressive of both the heart and mind of the man who wrote them. And he calls it a passion. He, he says it's a fit that took hold of him, and it was ravenous like a lust. Right. Um, Lewis cannot be well understood apart from these books, and they contain some of his best theological work even though they are also some of the more difficult of Lewis's books, uh, certainly the most difficult of his fiction um, to read. Now, in 1935, just before the publication of um, Out of the Silent Planet, just three years before Out of the Silent Planet came out, Lewis came across this work, A Voyage to Arcturus by David Lindsay, which had been written in 1920. And uh, Lewis says of this that from this book he, quote, learned what other planets in fiction were really good for. Spiritual adventures. That's what he learned from reading Lindsay's Voyage to Arcturus. So, so these three novels, then, are spiritual adventures. What that means, how to explain that, will go right to the heart of the achievement of these books, which is a brilliant interweaving of mythology with astronomy, of metaphysics with physics, and of theology with all of them. A spiritual adventure is one in which the hero goes on a significant spiritual journey in the course of resolving the plot. And of course for Lewis this is going to mean a Christian journey, and so Ransom has got to make progress in what we might call discipleship. He is a sort of medieval knight on a quest. He will be changed forever by the quest. But it is not as if the quest didn't matter for its own sake. However much the quest of the Holy Grail changes Percival and Bors, doesn't really do very much to Galahad, um, it's still important that the Holy Grail be found. It's not as if the Holy Grail is just a MacGuffin to facilitate the spiritual growth of these characters. No, the point is still, in fact, the point is so much the finding of the Grail that the spiritual growth of the characters is a necessary step to achieving that end. Same thing here. In these stories, there's a lot at stake in the encounter of worlds, but it's not, perhaps, what the humans from Earth might think is at stake in the encounter of these worlds. And that's going to be really important, too. Well, other influences abound um, for this work. Um, here's a list of, uh, that I've compiled of some of the influences that I've noted. Milton's Paradise Lost, uh, which Lewis had been lecturing on from 1937 on, uh, the Arthurian Psycho, both in its British and French versions, which Lewis was uh, a published scholar on. Uh, Wagner's Ring Cycle, the four operas of Wagner's uh, Ring Cycle, which Lewis explicitly connects in one letter to the tempo of Paralandra. Genesis 1 and 3, the story of creation and fall, as well as Genesis 11, 4 through 9, the Tower of Babel. Um, the title, That Hideous Strength, is a reference to a poem about uh, the Tower of Babel. Dante's Purgatorio, um, which Lewis again expressly connects to um, Paralandra. William Morris, uh, he is a, an author that Lewis greatly admired, um, and whose works *The Well at the End*, at *The World's End*, and *The Wood Beyond the World* had palpable influence on the Narnia stories. Um, Morris also authored a version of the uh, Ring Cycle myths, the the Norse myths, called *The Story of Sigurd the Volsung and the Fall of the Nibelungs*. 
Um, and Lewis explicitly names this as one of his sources uh, for this material. Bernardus Silvestris, a, a relatively obscure medieval uh, thinker, his book De Mundi Universitate, concerning the entirety of the world. And Olaf Stapleton's Last and First Men and J.B.S. Haldane's Possible Worlds, which were negative influences um, on the story in the sense that they were an occasion for um, Lewis's response. So we'll get into some of these sources as we progress through the um, as we progress through the course, um, but only as much as looking at the sources can illuminate the passages that inform them. Because the concern here is not a scholar's concern with documenting the sources, but a reader's concern with seeing new deaths in passages by understanding their illusions. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is something of the, the purpose, um, the achievement, the meaning of these, um, of these books. And to do that, I want to return to that description of science fiction that Gernsback gave above. He says that future ages will look back on science fiction stories as, quote, having blazed a new trail, not only in literature and fiction, but progress as well. And this is absolutely the case. Science fiction has predicted the rise and contributed to the development of new technologies like satellites, Arthur C. Clarke, the internet, Werner Vinge, but it has also predicted directions in society like government surveillance, George Orwell, same-sex marriage, and the legalization of marijuana, John Bruner. These are not mere predictions. In fact, they may be a species of the sort of prophecy popularized by another of the science fiction giants, Frank Herbert. In his Dune books, which are regaining popularity thanks to fresh movie adaptations, Herbert asks the question whether the prophet sees the future or shapes it. He settles firmly on the latter. In seeing the future, the prophet forces the future to conform to the way it has been foreseen. Before um, someone like Paul Atreides looks and sees what's going to happen in the future, the future is indeterminate and any number of things can happen. But once Paul sees it as happening in this way, his knowledge is true knowledge, which means the future events must correspond to his knowledge, otherwise that knowledge wouldn't be true, and so now the future has to happen that way. This is actually just an application of an ancient philosophical problem of foreknowledge that, to my mind, received a satisfactory response from Boethius in 524 AD. But it's a fascinating fictionalization of this problem, and it leads to um, a, a sprawling epic that is really breathtaking um, in all of its particulars. So what this means for science fiction is neither mystical nor deeply metaphysical. In order to invent something, we humans first have to conceive of it. Another way to put this is that a thing has to be invented in thought before it can be invented in the world of things. We have the technology to create things that we haven't yet because no one has thought them up. And we have things we want to invent that we do not yet have the technology for. Science fiction runs ahead of um, both the sum total of things we have yet dreamed up and what our technology is capable of. It runs ahead of both of those things to imagine new possibilities. It dreams up things we haven't thought of before, and it dreams up things that our technology can't keep up with yet. Once imagined, these can become goals that scientists and engineers can work towards. Right? So, for example, Arthur Clarke envisioned and described communication satellites. When he does so, he sets off the work of trying to create communication satellites. So tightly were those two things connected that a lot of people consider him to be the inventor of satellites, even though he never designed or constructed a satellite himself. <laughs> the work of science fiction, then, as a visionary medium, is to project along existing paths of societal or scientific development, or to imagine branching or alternative paths of development, and, and then to work out the implications of those projections. So you look and you think, okay, so computer technology is going in this direction, and so you project further along that line, and so this is eventually going to turn into a worldwide network of interconnected computers, and then you play with the implications of that. What's that going to start doing to society and to individuals and to how we learn and all of those sorts of things? Now, Lewis wants to use this principle, um, but in some sense he wants to turn it upon his head. 
He wants to use the science fiction genre to challenge some of the usual convictions and aims of science fiction. So in the first place, he wants to challenge um, what he would call scientism, a notion that's become much more common today than it was when he first coined the term in response to J.B.S. Haldane's criticism of Out of the Silent Planet. Haldane says that Lewis is attacking science, and Lewis says it's not an attack on science. It's an attack, quote, on something which might be called scientism, a certain outlook on the world which is casually connected with the popularization of the sciences though it is much less common among real scientists than among their readers. This view is seen most clearly in West End and Out of the Silent Planet, and this is one of the things we're going to discuss in detail as we progress through that book, is what is this scientism, what does it look like, how do we see that in the ways that West End acts not only towards Ransom, but also towards the Malachondrians. Now Lewis also wants to combat the notion, the assumption that humanity is superior to all other life, um, including other rational life. And he also another assumption he wants to combat that is usually paired with that is the notion that any means ought to be undertaken for the preservation of the human species, including the extermination of other rational species. So if we need to expand to another planet because we've killed ours, and um, we find another habitable planet and there's another sentient species there and they don't want us to move in, we would be justified in eradicating that species in the name of perpetuating our species. So in this image here, we would perhaps be the aliens in the spaceships launching the super weapons to destroy this other um, civilization. Um, another thing he wants to challenge, and this is a, a kind of a, this is a familiar one to readers of uh, Narnia, um, is this notion of progress. You know, we saw that in the Gernsbeck passage. He says that science fiction is uh, pushes forward, drives forward progress. It's an engine of progress, you might say. Um, and Lewis might well respond with Caspian's words from the Voyage of the Dodge Rider. You remember Governor Gumpus says, have you no notion of progress, of development? And Caspian says, I have seen them both in an A. We call it going bad in Narnia. And so for Lewis, he, he many times in his writings addresses this notion of progress and says that, you know, progress has to be distinguished from mere change, which is too often what we mean. And so going down a path of technological development is not necessarily progress if in the process we lose what makes us human and what's most urgent about being human. Another thing Lewis wants to challenge are, um, is a whole set of assumptions about the nature of space, the uh, outer space, right, the space outside of the Earth's atmosphere, that proceed from too much attention to the observational facts and too little attention to the meaning of the thing. The, um, the genius of his marrying of medieval cosmology with the astronomy of his day will be one of our major topics of conversation. Lastly, and, and this is in many ways uh, the purest application of the dynamics of science fiction uh, that we see in the trilogy, he wishes to dramatize the disturbing direction he sees in modern education and that he explained in detail in The Abolition of Man. He wants to dramatize that so we can really see that in action. This is especially done in the last book, um, which is subtitled A Modern Fairy Tale. How it's a fairy tale and what we're to take away from the comparison of fairy tales will be an important topic for our later discussions. So in all of these ways, Lewis is speaking from a viewpoint not commonly shared by the writers of science fiction, and in fact directly opposed to a lot of their common worldview. But this critical or dystopian stance is one that is commonplace within science fiction. And so what he's able to do is to weaponize the genre against many of its own assumptions and goals. As Anglican theologian E.L. Maskell said of it, this is an altogether satisfactory story in which fiction and theology are so skillfully blended that the non-Christian will not realize that he is being instructed until it is too late. So these books then are meant to instruct, to challenge, and to criticize but they're also meant to inspire. And, and here we want to focus on the character for whom the trilogy is sometimes named. Sometimes it's called the Ransom Trilogy. Elwin Ransom is not so remarkable a man at the beginning of the story. He's a Christian, 
but does not seem to be a man of special or outstanding faith. He's a philologist, and no doubt a very good one, but philologists rarely make the news for their discoveries. When he realizes that there is language on Malachandra, his great thought is that he could be the one to write the first Malachandrian grammar. This is a philologist's dream. But if he were to realize this dream, hardly anyone outside the small circle of philologists would ever read it. So because of this, it's easy to connect with him and to see ourselves in him. He's not this great towering hero that we could never be. He starts from a place very similar to where we would start from as a reader. He acts with great courage and virtue, but he comes by it honestly. He has to learn it in the course of the things he experiences. In this way, we can grow in courage with him, right? As we watch him developing his courage in the face of these challenges, we can grow in that same courage along with him. And his journey is one that we can see ourselves emulating. One of the great joys of this series is to see how far Ransom comes and to catch the vision that perhaps we too could become much more than we ever dared to dream. So this is the journey that I'm going to take you on in this course. And so I hope that I'm excited to begin this discussion with you, um, to have the time to really dig into these books in a great deal of detail. Uh, if this, this course starts on Thursday, May 5th, if you haven't signed up for it yet, um, you can visit the website there and, and check it out and get signed up. Um, and whether you're joining the course or not, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope that it prepares you, gets you excited for your first read or your next reread of Lewis's Great Cosmic Trilogy, which is truly one of the great science fiction series of the 20th centuries and a great gem that he's left us.